everyone welcome back to another episode of the waffle press retrospectives we're wrapping up season two of the failed blockbusters we're in the last two episodes of the season we're talking zardoz today i'm your, co- I'm your host diego crespo although i guess the a co-host also as well to my co-host matt garingo me. I'm, I'm, I'm garingo yeah how are you my name is matt garingo i am also known as arthur shran i am zardoz Matt, you spoiled Zardoz for me a couple years back. Do you remember this? Yeah, but did I? <laughs> uh, spoilers for Zardoz. I just want to say, uh, would you recommend it? Let's just get that out of the way first for people yeah, that haven't sure. seen it yet. You'll never see anything like it. It runs out of steam at a certain point, but um, it's a wild movie. Yeah, I would recommend it as well. It is not like some misbegotten masterpiece i do think it's very interesting and i think director john borman is just was just a dude that uh had a lot of really big interesting ideas and i i don't think he quite ever got them working as well as they used to at a certain point in his career um this is a movie um, that comes in that weird era, uh, but post two thousand one Space Odyssey, but pre Star Wars, which is like the most interesting era for science fiction films. You say interesting, but is it? How do I put this? Was there a lot of good science fiction in that era? Um, of course, but like, okay, it's you know. It, there's good and bad um but like they also it's a bunch of science fiction stuff that just it they never really left the 70s you know what i'm saying yeah yeah doing like i just wanted to get zardoz right like <laughs> no, one is, no one is saying that even you know yeah well i mean because like okay let's look at the era of the 1970s well we'll go we'll, we'll just cover the entire 70s because that's what i have open on the internet right now I have to stop at star wars that really is a big demarcation line yes 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 all right so um we get silent running in 1972 you ever seen that silent running you've seen it i, I yeah that's a great movie like an environmental little thriller you know yeah yeah um um Black holes after Star Wars. Never mind. That that explains that movie, but I didn't know that. Let, let, let uh, me go through a bunch real quick. Cause I got the uh, I got the letterbox page open. For some all time. right. So got a Clockwork Orange, which is a science fiction movie. It's yeah. Dystopian. It's about mind control. Um, changes a lot about cinema. <laughs> Not just mm. that. Uh, you have um, Solaris. Yeah. You know? Um, you have Fantastic Planet. You've seen Fantastic Planet. The- yeah. Um, and then you get Westworld, one of my personal favorites. Yeah. And it fell to Earth. THX 1138, which is a lot closer to this than it is to Star Wars in a lot of ways. Woo! Uh, um, you, you have Soylent Green. I think we all know Soylent Green. Yeah, the people. Yeah, yeah. Spoilers. Um, this, oh come on! Logan's run. Um, Logan, he sure did run. Um, <laughs> have you ever seen Logan's Run? No, I just I know the it's it's kind of a like most dangerous game type thing, but in the future, right? No. <laughs> what the fuck am I thinking of? Logan's Run is uh, Logan's Run is. Am I thinking of Running Man? I think you might be, but fuck. Death Race two thousand. Um, which what year is that? That is 75, so that counts. Uh, but Logan's Run is like, it's a future where no one lives past the age of 30. Like, you can do whatever you want, but at 30, you get quote unquote renewed in a ceremony, and then like new people are born, right? Mm-hmm. And, but there's like, there are people that escape, they're runaways, and Logan is like, is tasked with finding them. And it's a, it's a whole, there's a whole thing going on there. 
It's one of those dystopian science fiction movies. Um, one thing of note. Hold on, let me let me check something real quick. This isn't a spoiler, but I gotta check it. Um, all right, I want you to go to Google Images real quick. Okay. In Logan's Run Robot. And look at this, this robot that shows up in Logan's Run. It's all right. <laughs> I, want your, I want your own live react. You see him? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, it's... You know, shows up in like the third act, and he's like, "Gaze upon my magnificence." <laughs> it's a bot. It's, it's it's great. It's like a it's like a little like a little box with arms. Yeah, that's kind of what he is. <laughs> All right. At the very tail end, released just before Star Wars, we have Wizards, the Ralph Bakshi animated film. Yeah, uh, which is a movie where fucking mutants are hyped up on Nazi propaganda to kill a bunch of elves. Yep, it's uh that movie's a trip. I forget have we talked about whether or not you're pro Ralph Bakshi. I have no idea what I am for Bakshi, but I'm glad. Okay, it's... me too. I, think I do just kind of hate Fritz the Cat though. I like Fritz the Cat. Fritz the Cat, but uh... nah. Well, the problem with Fritz the Cat is that it's just like a. a generic easy to point to like oh yeah fuck the system type movie and it's like yeah it's a little annoying yeah but i i like it it's like that like weird 70s disillusion it meant with the hippie movement you know that's a lot of yeah stuff mm -hmm. um rollerball rest in peace james con oh yeah yeah a boy and his dog the adaptation of the harlan Nelson story uh, oh phase four phase four but that's like that honestly doesn't really feel a part of these, if I'm being honest. And I love That's fine. That's fine. I don't know what it's a part of. I just like to reference phase four. If you haven't seen phase four, please, please seek it out. It is so strangely directed and edited and it, it's a great movie. But it's it's so bizarre in its construction. Colossus the Forbidden Project. That's an interesting one. I don't know that one. Shockwaves, which I think is about Nazi zombies. Oh, awesome. Oh, wait, did you ever see Capricorn 1? I have not seen Capricorn 1. What a great movie. An interesting little movie, though, um, about... Uh, it's kind of like a riff on moon landing conspiracy theories. But uh, it turns out, uh, like, they were... There's a manned mission to Mars being set up, right? Mm -hmm. It turned out that they actually fucked up making the rocket, and it would cost too much money to actually go rebuild it, so they decided to just fake the Mars landing. They don't tell the astronauts until the last minute what's going to happen, right? Mm -hmm. Look, if we land on it, we're going to get a boost in funding, and then we can really go to Mars. But then the rocket on the return mission uh, burns up in the atmosphere, and so now they have to kill the astronauts that were supposedly landed on Mars. <laughs> Oh, the crime and one of the astronauts is O.J. Simpson, by the way. <laughs> yeah, I was gonna say I, I just I looked up Capricorn One on Letterbox. Terrific poster. Great poster. O.J. Simpson is in the header for the the Letterbox page. Of course. And then the tagline that because you know Letterbox always puts the tagline of the movies in there for the descriptions. The mission was a sham. <laughs> the murder is real. <laughs> With O.J. Simpson just staring at the camera. I'm not making this up. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God, you got to take a screen cap of that. Oh, my God. <laughs> oh, my God. Oh, it's directed by Peter Hyam, so I actually I got a soft spot for. Yeah, yeah. He's a fine director. It's a solid movie. Um, just a weird one. It was like the paranoia of the 70s in that. Um, yep. Oh, you still laughing at the <laughs> Yes. <laughs> oh, man, that, that was... That took a turn. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> oh, there's Space is the Place starring Sun Ra. <laughs> Did you ever see that? No. Should I? It's a wild movie. Um, it's uh, it's on Criterion right now. It's oh, okay. It's part of, like, uh, the, like, um, Afro science fiction 
genre, I think, is what it's called on Criterion. Um, but, hey. Uh, oh, did you ever see Time After Time? No, I need to see Time After Time. Great. Another great poster. With Malcolm McDowell as H.G. Wells hunting Jack the Ripper. <laughs> Oh, that's so fucking awesome. Yeah, well, it turns out H.G. Wells built an... He did build a time machine. It turns out it was real. And Jack the Ripper steals it to come to modern America. Uh, there's a great scene in that movie where H.G. Wells follows him. Um, and he ends up in... It's like San Francisco in the 70s, right? Mm -hmm. He goes to, I think, a Burger King in it. And he's just kind of amazed at what the like tables are made out of. It's just a scene like of him like trying to figure out what the substance is in the tables at a Burger King. <laughs> <laughs> hey, did you know Nicholas Meyer apparently wrote an entire con miniseries for CBS and they just haven't greenlit it? Really? Yeah, like I don't know if that'd be like great or anything like that, but it's like I mean Meyer is if, if you got that ready to go, like I've seen the shit you greenlit. What the hell? I I honestly wonder if there's, like, a weird ego thing going on behind the scenes there of uh, what's-his-fuck. Um, Curseman? Yeah. Uh, that might make sense. Throwing his weight around. Because it was that weird thing of, remember, uh, there's, a lot of pe there's a lot of talented people involved in both Discovery and Picard, and, like, they always only seem to stay for, like, one season, you know? Mm -hmm. Like, Brian yeah. Fuller was going to do Discovery, and then they, they dumped him. And it's like, he's the perfect guy to do that. Like, and I wonder if there's like a weird thing with Kurtzman. And I wonder if there's something weird about the fact that like Strange New Worlds is like the one that like his name's on it, but we know he kind of doesn't have a strong hand in, you know, and people mm -hmm. are responding stronger to that one. Uh, but you know, yeah. Or like Lower Decks, which is like a comedy series, but like it's that like those are the ones that seem to be getting positive responses. I don't know. There's something weird going on there. Yeah, yeah, I don't know. First, also, just a, another tangent, really quickly about Picard, um, a show I've not seen past the pilot of. Mm. So the first season, you know, they they want to establish a whole new crew of characters for Picard to hang around. Only recurring like references or passing uh, cameos from the the next gen crew. Makes total sense, right? Heard the show doesn't really work, but that makes total sense. Uh, the second season, primarily just the new crew. They go on their own adventure, time travel, yada, yada, yada. Everyone, I'm sure, is aware of the the legendary Red Letter Media reactions to them losing their minds over the show. Um, now, the third season. Do you know the premise of the third season? No. That's coming Isn't out. Isn't there, like, there's, there's more time travel shit, right? Like... I don't know about that. But the setup is that they're dumping all the new cast members and they're making it a TNG reunion for Picard's final go around. Hmm. To the point where the original, or I guess the, the new cast members are no longer series regulars and may not even like cameo. That's depressing. That is a little depressing, right? Like that's kind of fucked up. Like, it's fucked up. I, I, I know, I'm sure that's like a budgetary thing, but it, that's. It was their show. I, you know? The whole Picard thing just seemed wrong-headed from the start. You know? Oh, y yes. Completely. I would that's, I would never have given that show the green light. That, I think that's the big problem here, you know? that. And I guess they just want to do the nostalgia thing for the final season. I mean, if you got nothing else, I guess that's what you fall back on. Yeah. And see, if, you, if you're going to me, Diego, what do you want to do with Star Trek? Have Picard play a supporting role in the first season of whatever new show it is. Well, no, you know, there you go. Here's honestly, you know, here's what I would honestly do. If you want to do a show called Star Trek Picard, right? Mm -hmm. It is one season. It's a mini series, right? You're right. only going to do ten episodes. Use it to just close the book on the TNG thing, right? Mm -hmm. Just do that, and then that's it, right? That's all. That, don't do anything else. Like, of course, new characters. I'm fine with that, but it shouldn't have been a series. It should have been yeah. an episodes and done. And, like, I was always, I was so shocked when it was like, why are they even doing a second season? Like, that was what baffled me more. And, mm -hmm. and I was like, oh, because they want to turn this into a show. And I'm like, that's so wrong, because it's just, I, I really want to know what happens after the TNG era. I want a similar leap in time that they did between TNG and the original series, you know? 
Yeah. And I was like, all right, fine, do this Picard to, like, be an epilogue and then jump off from there and do something different. And, like, they just don't want to do it. I think part of it is just that no one there has any real vision, you know? I mean, yeah. Like, even, like, uh, New Worlds, like, which I think we both heard more positive responses towards, right? But still, it really is great to hear. As someone who loves Star Trek, it's great to hear that, okay, it looks like they cracked the code on something finally. It's still not, like, a new thing, you know? It's like, okay, just do that in a new thing, you know? Like, come on, you're killing me here. It's It drives me nuts a little bit. Yeah. Do Zardoz in Star Trek, which I guess they kind of have in a way a little bit, well, at least, like, one time. All right, well, here's, here's my pitch. So what you do is you you ha- you set up these things in the galaxy. They discover these things. They call them these mass relays, right? Mm-hmm. Have something involve them called the mass effect particles. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I like where you're going with this. It turns out when you open this gate, you end up at this citadel where like all these other alien species are, right? Oh, it's like but like who built these devices? And it's like even these aliens didn't build it. And there's like a mystery there, you know. Mm-hmm. You could explain why everyone looks humanoid in a weird way, but also now humanity, which was the top dog in the Milky Way, is now in this like weird, like subservient position to these other alien races. Oh, maybe, maybe there's like these giant, like eldritch, like part machine, part biological, like gods out there that just like they come and they they like cull the universe, like the way you would like like cull a field of wheat. They're kind of like reapers, you know, and they, they there's like a cycle and like it's like, oh, we have to break the cycle. But then there's like an ethical question of like, well, what does breaking the cycle even mean, man? And like, how do we make these problems fit together? Is this just an eternal battle, the battle between life and machine? Is this just a, a, an inherent issue that comes with the nature of progress? And is there a limit on it? And then, I don't know, you know, we can go to the Andromeda Galaxy. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I I like where your head's at, and I think that's exactly what they should do. Yeah. I, that also did make me want to just replay Mass Effect and try out Andromeda for the first time, which I heard is a fucking mess. Legend but... Edition. Is that what the new ones are called? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, Legend, because, like, it's impossible to get the old games to run on PCs anymore, like... Yeah, yeah. That's there, but, uh, hey. When I transferred all my my old stuff that I I needed for my my new PC, I, like, my Mass Effect is just gone. Mm. Like, it didn't even... I don't know what that's about. That might have been a me thing. But uh, that is funny that you mentioned that. I was like, oh, yeah, my Mass Effect isn't there. (laughs) I have to get the new version now. Hey, what what are you gonna do? I'm gonna play Mass Effect. I mean, I do have my my Twitch set up for uh, uh, streaming Resident Evil 8 because I made a promise, a vow to the people of my Twitch stream that I would play that only when I could stream it. It's all good to go. So is that the horny one? That's the yeah, the tall lady that everyone was like, "Mommy." Oh yeah, that was a, that was and a moment. That was, I mean, people didn't leave the house for like a year. That's what I'm saying. It was peak quarantine moment. Like, yeah, it's just like, oh, tall lady, we're there for it. Yeah. yeah. See, imagine if She-Hulk came out a year before that, like before it did, and it would have been out around at the same time. People would have just exploded. I don't know, She-Hulk. It would have had to have been like the first shot of that She-Hulk trailer would have had to have been like her like standing on someone's face, like. <laughs> <laughs> fucking i don't know man i don't know or how, the, how about that she hulk um I don't, I'm, I'm not interested but I, I bet people are overreacting to how bad they think it is because they're fucking misogynists oh, look, it's like it's, the regular bad marvel stuff doesn't make you act like that fucking fucking diego here being the disney shill am i right guy oh my god yeah <laughs> So we didn't have this exact conversation before recording. Yeah. <laughs> ben Wong's on the show. I know, I like that Wong is just now he, magical Nick Fury. Now he's the guy that's just everywhere. Yeah, because I mean Benedict Wong's just a, like a a great actor, and he's got such a great presence too. But our, I like that he's got this role. Fuck it, we're not doing Marvel anymore. We gotta stop. We gotta talk Zardoz. All right, Zardoz. <laughs> Zardoz. Zardoz, um, yeah, it's Wizard of Oz. Um, 
Yeah, but it's also wrong. It, it is wrong. No. All right. All right, fuck. We're going to jump to that point because that's the twist. The twist is Zardoz, the name comes from the Wizard of Oz, right? The, yes. You cover up a few letters and it's Wizard of Oz, which which makes me think that's how fucking John Borman, like he spilled a cup of coffee on a copy of Wizard of Oz and then he was like, oh, hey, Zardoz. And then he wrote a movie around that. Um, but that's, he's like, at the end of that story, I mean, that's why, that's a terrible Connery. It's like the, yeah, I that I didn't know what that was. It's like the fucking at the end of the story, the wizard's a fake. It's all a fake. That's not how the book ends. That's how the movie ends. <laughs> it's like a whole other third act in the fucking book. And so that to me, when John Borman's out there being like, "Oh, I was inspired by the work of L. Frank Baum," it's like, no, you weren't, you fuck. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I won't call John Borman a fuck. Fuck. I don't. No, look, because here's that's a thing people do. People go. Oh, I was inspired by the work of L. Frank Baum. And then they just referenced the fucking MGM movie. And it's like, that's fine. But just admit that. Don't act like you're going back to what L. Frank Baum was doing. Yeah. A lot yeah. of other ideas in his book. Like, there's a lot more in The Wizard of Oz. The book's violent as shit, too. I should read that book. Those books are actually, like, tons of fun. And you can read them in, like, an afternoon. <laughs> like, awesome. So, like, read the original L. Frank Baum run, you know. Uh, but yeah, like it, that, that, that was something that just annoyed me. <laughs> All right. It, it was one of those where like, I'm like, maybe John Borman doesn't know what he's doing. I, I hesitate to say he doesn't. I even, but I think I read interviews where he was like, look, I didn't even know what I was doing. <laughs> Cause he was like, I was on so much, so many drugs making Zardoz. <laughs> You know what? That makes a lot of sense. So I actually looked up some interviews with uh, John Borman. Do a commentary for the Blu-ray, but I do not own the Blu-ray. Yes, but I I did look up the commentary. Mm. I checked it out. But uh, an interview I want to reference is from DP Thirty Thirty, that interview channel I referenced before. Lots of great talking head segments with literally like countless people from the industry, be they actors, writers, directors, cinematographers, like the whole shebang. You're curious about an interview with someone, it's probably going to be on there. There is an interview with John Borman where he was talking about Zardoz. He was talking about a lot of stuff, but uh, he it was brought up uh, Zardoz getting the re-release. And John Borman said very, like, point blank, yeah, I don't know why they're doing that. <laughs> like, uh, he, he was shocked because he's like, you know, it, it failed miserably when it came out at the box office and critically. And then no one cared about it. It was never a financial success ever, even with the initial like home video releases. But now people want to revisit it, and he just didn't get it. He was like, I don't know why that one. I th- uh, And I respect that. I think it's developed this reputation of just being like, I think it gets lumped into like so bad it's good categories, but it's not that, you know? It's No, no, it's not. It's not. I don't... I don't even like dislike this movie. I, I don't think it works, but I find it so interesting. Yeah, it like doesn't work really, but it is fascinating. And there's just there's kind of not that many other movies like it, you know. Mm-hmm. Like I was watching and I was like, oh, John Berman saw the Holy Mountain, but like <laughs> <laughs> also other stuff here, and it's just it's. Yeah, this is a bizarre movie. Well, look, I mean, like, along with Excalibur, when we talked about the Zack Snyder Justice League last year and BBS, like, I think this this stuff totally, like, like I, I totally see why John Borman is, like, Zack Snyder's favorite director. Yeah, and I think that's, I think I've, this, this has finally cracked it for me, which I say about every time we bring up Zack Snyder, but it's like, he really kind of is the, like, he's doing John Borman shit, you know? Yeah, he's got all these huge, huge ideas about, like, how we look at, like, our modern mythology, like, what comprises, like, heroism, like, where we we get these, like, belief systems even and, like, societal structures. Some of it is, like, very progressive. Other elements feel very regressive. Yes. And you can't tell if it's, like, is this what the filmmaker believes or is this what they're exploring with the movie? Like... Mm-hmm. And it's just a weird hodgepodge of stuff that I think it gives. It's the power of both these guys, where it's like, even when it doesn't work, it's like Exorcist Two. You know, Exorcist Two is a bad movie. 
Yes. Like, fascinating. <laughs> like There's stuff in Exorcist 2 that I would like if it was not Exorcist 2, if that makes sense. The house, like, explodes with bugs at the end. Locusts. The idea, the visual ideas in the film of Exorcist 2, The Heretic, Mark Kermode's least favorite film. I'm bringing him up again because he has, like, a, he's got, like, a beef with John Borman because of The Exorcist 2 and then everything else he made after that. Yeah. But it's just, like, there's this great visual compass to Exorcist 2 where it's, like, so much about, like, the reflections of the mind and, like, how it, like, breaks through, like, our, the power of, like, the human mind and our beliefs. And it's, like, but why is it, like, here, like why are we doing that for this movie? Why is it about that character? Why is it... that? I, I'm willing to bet that's not a John Borman problem. That's just a... a a company being like, let's do a sequel to The Exorcist. I think, yeah, it's, it's let's do a sequel to The Exorcist, and then I'm John Borman, I just made Zardoz, <laughs> no one's giving me work, I'll do Exorcist too. Like, mm -hmm. and then I'm just gonna do what I want. <laughs> like, Yeah, yeah, and it, it ends up not working there either. And uh, he does Excalibur. Which I admire. Yeah. Another one quite a bit. doesn't totally work, but it's, like, fascinating, you know? Yeah, yeah. I, I would recommend Excalibur and I, over Zardoz. I think that's just what you got to say about, like, most of Snyder's films as well, you know? Mm -hmm. like, they don't totally work, but they're fascinating. Yeah, you know, like, Army of the Dead. I'm like, I, I want to go to bat for that more than I could, but it's like... He's playing with more than just, like, remaking Aliens with zombies, you know? Like, there's stuff going on in that movie that I really admire. And then some stuff that is, like, so blatant, I'm like, dude, I get it. Move on. What's weird is it would be a better movie if it was kind of just about its premise. If it <laughs> yes. It was just the zombie heist film, you know? Mm. Instead, Zack Snyder puts all his Zack Snyder stuff in it, but that's what makes it interesting. And then the actual plot is an interesting like that's that's what's wild about it like yeah yeah like why are we and so like what he gets hung up on and i say this about john borman too it's just like why <laughs> mm -hmm. and also i think john borman just assumes everyone knows every reference he's making uh yes it's like yes but then also the wizard of oz thing calls into question everything because he gets the wizard of oz book wrong mm -hmm. it's like John Borman, you're doing all this imagery. I don't know if you know what any of this means. <laughs> and But then, on top of that, then it's just like, well, then fuck what he means. I'm just going to bring what I see to this movie. And that's kind of what you ultimately should do with art. So maybe that's the gag the whole time. Maybe he is that Arthur fucking Frayn guy. Like it's Maybe. He's just, he's just fucking around. He's fucking with you, and he's hoping you figure it out. Because he wants you to murder him. <laughs> Death. Whoa. <laughs> I, maybe, you know, like, like, like maybe, because Excalibur, I mean, what's the story of, like, King Arthur, you know, it's like, you go through this whole, like, mythical journey with this character, he, he, he grows, he makes mistakes, like, he's a hero, but, like, he ultimately feels like, towards the end of his days, like, you know, it was all a lost cause, like, was it all worth it, it's not about, like, the symbolism of, of his, like, mythological stature, it's his humanity, that makes him a hero, right? And, like, Zardoz is, is maybe, like, a precursor to that. Oh, definitely. In just a really fucked up way. Uh, not because of, like, story content or anything like that, but just fucked up because it's so, like, scatterbrained. You know, I mean, like, the what, what's, like, the opening image? Like, one of the opening images is, like, just guns pouring out of a mouth of a floating head. Yeah. But also, the opening yeah. image of this movie is Arthur Frayne talking to us. Which is, like, one of the, like, I, it's one of those where it's, like, Someone re-released Zardoz in a theater. I have to see this shot on a screen. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, can you imagine? It's 74. You don't know what the fuck Zardoz is. You walk into this movie, and then that head just starts floating on the screen. <laughs> like, at home, I have reference for it. It feels like an old, like, Windows XP screensaver. <laughs> <laughs> but, like, can you imagine on a big screen? I'm just like, the blackness, and then this little head just is like, I am Arthur Frayne. <laughs> I've lived for 300 years, but I long death. Like, I am a creation, but who created you? <laughs> That's how, like, every fucking science fiction movie in the 70s started with some bullshit like that. And then it's just like, oh, and then there's the floating head, which was modeled after John Borman, by the way. 
Yeah, I what, yeah. I don't know what he's trying to say there. No, no, maybe you have a point then about, like, how, how we interpret, like, these stories. Like, can t- maybe his... Who can tell what the message is? <laughs> <laughs> Who can solve this riddle? Um, and, yeah, and it's just that floating head. The credits don't even end when the head says the gun is good, the penis is evil. Yeah. <laughs> We're still in the middle of the opening credits. <laughs> uh, well, you know, dude, rock. <laughs> fuck you. <laughs> we, I am putting a stop to the phrase dudes rock. We're, <laughs> we're done. It's in the books. We're done saying dudes rock. we got to end that one. Because um, they most certainly do not hear. Our no. Hero's a rapist. Yeah, no, no. None of that. But, yeah. Uh, anyway, uh, this is the movie he made after he couldn't get his Lord of the Rings adaptation made. Oh my god, John Borman tried to do Lord of the Rings? You don't know about this? I don't know about this. Uh, guess what? His script's out there. It's fucking insane. <laughs> okay. Odo and Gladriel have sex in it. Oh. Gimli is, like, rebirthed in mud at one point. Oh. The the history of the ring at the Council of Elrond is like a rock opera. <laughs> oh. It's pure insanity. Um, yeah, it didn't get made. Okay. Um, which paved the way for Ralph Bakshi to do his uh, Lord of the Rings adaptation. Oh. Um, which is another another weird one. It's, it's interesting. Yeah. It's interesting. And maybe this is a weird way of explaining why Zardoz is interesting now, because now we're we're living in the middle of the Rings of Power being released, which now we get to live to an age where the Lord of the Rings looks like every other goddamn thing on the market right now, um, and it's it's this weird like every every IP everything's been turned into IP and all the edges are being sanded off, right? Mm-hmm. It's impossible to do that with Zardoz. <laughs> you just cannot make this movie palatable to a general public and i think objects like that are, are like what kind of have become fascinating you know like that's why mm-hmm. i think we kind of return to something like zardoz um so maybe you know i mean I, I do think that's part of the reason why a lot of people including myself reevaluated uh zach snyder in a way you know it's like He's a dude who, who doesn't really fit in the stuff. When they tried to make his work fit in to the more traditional way of making Hollywood blockbusters in, in the 2010s, he got the, the Joss Whedon just sleek, and it was like a disaster. I, I, have a different, I have a different theory about Snyder, which is less that he couldn't fit into the studio system, just that there was a moment in our culture where we were either going to take Zack Snyder's path or we were going to take Joss Whedon's path. And we took Joss Whedon's path. And I'm not saying that one is better than the other. Like, it's bad for one style to be dominant over all culture, you know? Mm -hmm. Like, I just think that's... Like, he's like... Zack Snyder's the Cambrian explosion, you know? (laughs) There's all those fossils you get that, like, are like, these are all the weird directions life could... I've made this point before on the show. I'm just like, these are all the weird directions life could have gone in. And Mm -hmm. Snyder was like, here's a direction that all our blockbusters could have gone in. And it just didn't happen, you know? Yeah. And, like, maybe it never could have, but it, it was a possibility. And it turned out Joss Whedon won. And, and, you know, that sucks, but that's what happened. Yeah. And I'm not even trying to throw Joss Whedon under the bus there, even though he's someone who should be thrown under a bus these days. Yeah. It's just, like, yeah. we, were, we were picking something to be, like, this is what culture is going to be. And it was almost Snyder. And... It just didn't happen, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, I think now Snyder is kind of entering this period of just like, now he's more in his John Borman phase. Yeah, like he's doing a, a full-on like Star Wars riff yeah. for like a two-part epic for Netflix. And I'm like, yeah, give me that. Why not? Like, it, yeah. it's going to be weird, but... Maybe don't be your own cinematographer this time. See? Um, yeah. But I, I think so, yeah. Yeah, I know. Hey, he... Don't shoot wide open, dude! It doesn't look good when you shoot everything wide open. It's, it's, fuck, sorry. It's like a pet peeve of mine with all this shit now. Hey, you know, whatever. It's <laughs> fucking stacked cast for that movie, though. I know. It. I know. 
I'm really looking forward to that. Um, as Blood Axe. <laughs> is that real? Yeah, it's what it says on Wikipedia. Oh my god, what a fucking... He's just a 13-year-old boy making movies. Is named Cora. Is that... This has to be the best movie ever. Zack Slander, a fucking Legend of Korra fan. That... If he is, I'll love him even more. Here's the thing, if he's an Avatar fan... Him liking Legend of Korra makes a lot of sense. <laughs> yes. Him being the one that still likes Legend of Korra makes a lot of sense. <laughs> um, yeah, looking forward to that, whatever the fuck it is. Uh, Zardoz. I just keep... Zardoz. Did you know Burt Reynolds was originally going to play Zed? Yeah, and then he got sick. Yeah. Uh, which I'm sure is what happened. <laughs> Um, <laughs> he's like read the script and John Borman's explaining everything to him in a room okay, not to make my stupid metaphor again but like the entire 70s is the Cambrian explosion <laughs> like here's the weird direction cinema could have gone in so like people probably reading Zardoz being like I don't understand it but maybe this is what's next you know it, mm -hmm. they talk about like how all the executives read Star Wars being like I don't know what the fuck you're trying to do Lucas Let's <laughs> try it like and then boom it, that ends up being it you know we mm -hmm. taken the path of Zardoz. We took the path of Star Wars. That's what happened. I'm sorry. I, I just need I just need to go back to the the Rebel Moon thing. That's the Zack Snyder Star Wars picture that he's, he's doing. Anthony Hopkins is the voice of Jimmy, <laughs> a sentient JC one four three five mechanized battle robot and one time defender of the slain king. Exactly. That's. <laughs> that's <laughs> Oh boy, most anticipated of 2023. Well, good thing he got in like just under the wire for Netflix to implode. Cause... I know, I know. God, God bless him. Yeah, God bless him. Uh, <laughs> sorry. Um. All right. So John Borman also added the opening scene with the floating head uh, to try to explain the picture to audiences who oh. didn't seem to understand what the film was about, and he hoped it would make things clearer. After, like, I guess, test screenings. And then he also goes on to say it didn't work. <laughs> it's like, yeah, no fucking shit. <laughs> yeah, like... <laughs> that just makes things more confusing. Yeah, imagine you're, you're trying to learn how to cook from someone who only speaks, like, Spanish or something like that. And it's like, I'm sorry, I, I don't speak Spanish. Could you, could you try explaining another way? And they start speaking French. It's like, no, it, that doesn't help me. I'm sorry. <laughs> you need to read a plot synopsis of this movie before watching it to understand it. Like, yeah. Kind of did. Yeah. Because there's, like, genetic engineering and, like, eugenics and, like, there's there's so many things that, like, and then they throw that curveball at the end where it's like, actually, these guys are the old scientists. And it's like, <laughs> what? Why? <laughs> yeah. Oh my god. Uh, oh, uh, Borman also comments that, like, you know, he wishes uh, there were simpler days when you could show a film's credit, like, entirely at the beginning of the movie. Mm -hmm. Like, you, that way you just kind of wrap up. Like, the old classic motion picture epics, you know? And then you just wrap up when the movie ends. And it's like, okay, thanks for coming. The end, Finn, whatever. The, but he also goes on to say, like, there weren't as many people working on them back then. That's why now you have to give credit to literally everyone who's part of the movie, which is good for him to recognize and you know like because i thought about that too i'm like yeah i just do like the the fucking credit sequences for like 10 minutes if you have to but like even i would get bored of that <laughs> you know you could have the greatest you could have like the chinatown credit sequences with like the big mm. names up on like those classic billboards and shit like that and you know it's, it goes on for like 15 minutes because there's so many people to credit it's like yeah all right let, let's let's start the picture <laughs> Let's get it going. All right, Diego, I want you to explain to me the plot of Zardoz. I'm not doing that. I want you to explain <laughs> to me the plot of Zardoz. All right, hang on. Let me get that Wikipedia page open. This is going to make it... I'm going to make it simpler myself. All right, you know what? Let me just explain, like, the opening of the movie, right? No. No, no. do that. Um, okay. So we get Arthur whatever the fuck, and he's like, I am Zardoz. And then you're like, what? <laughs> and then, um... And then there's this giant head floating around, and that's that's actually Zardoz, I guess. And there's all these guys dressed up in weird outfits with guns running around, and they worship Zardoz as a god, and 
Zardoz says, the gun is good, the penis is evil. And he's like, you got to murder and stop spreading seed and disease because the planet is poisoned. Um, then the movie actually starts. <laughs> Sean Connery is in like a pile of wheat. You don't really know what's happening at first. You can maybe eventually put together that he's in the Zardoz head. <laughs> um, and he's in the Zardoz head flying away. And he's he's hiding. And then Arthur Friend comes out and he shoots him. And he's like, you. And I wouldn't blame anyone for not putting together that he's reacting in a way that means he recognizes who Sean Connery is. <laughs> And then he flies out. He literally flies out the window. <laughs> like, he doesn't <laughs> fall. He flies. Like, <laughs> and it's like, oh, I guess Zardoz dies five minutes into Zardoz. <laughs> um, and then he ends up in, like, this rich English countryside type place. And it turns out this is where the Eternals live. And the Eternals use the Brutals which is Sean Connery's people, to harvest wheat to grow food. And the food is to keep alive the apathetics. And then there's also, what were the what were the old people called? The, uh, not the Vortex. The Vortex, vortex is the other thing. The, uh, uh, they're called like the Rebels or something like that? Or the Renegades. Is it? The Renegades. The Renegades. Wait, no, no, no. Is it uh, the, the Brutals? No, Brutals are Sean Connery. Jesus Christ. Renegade <laughs> people. Okay, okay, okay. Permanently aged and, like, will have to live eternity with, like, being senile. Right? The apathetic mm -hmm. ones that haven't aged, they haven't done anything wrong, but they just stand around and do nothing, so they have to make bread for them or else they'll die. <laughs> um, so, yeah. That's, like, the setup, I guess. <laughs> The yeah yeah that that yeah, kind of covers it um the the actual like dearth of that description the story like what drives the narrative like the thematic meat I just realized you can kind of just watch Mad God a little bit yeah uh for those that haven't seen Phil Tippett's Mad God it's that stop motion animated feature that came out earlier this year in two thousand twenty two um maybe don't watch it. Uh, under the influence of anything, or if you've eaten recently, and if it's too gross for you, then I would recommend Zardoz, because it is a very disgusting motion picture, but it is also maybe genius, <laughs> and um, kind of covers a lot of the same ground as Zardoz, but I think much more efficiently, and uh, I, I think that's all I got now for Zardoz. No, that's not true. Um, I want to talk more about about the uh, your post on Zardoz, actually. You made a little statement on Letterboxd that this is just England. I mean, it is. <laughs> yes. Uh, which is also probably why John Borman wrote this idea as well. Uh, he's Irish, you know, so shout out to him this week because the Queen died. The Irish are happy about that. Yes. I, I, I mean, I'm sorry. I looked at Twitter while you were talking and someone said something dumb and now I'm bothered. So, okay. <laughs> my fucking day. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's fine. It's fine. Do you, you want to bring it up now? Because oh, I don't want to yell at anyone, but I can oh, okay. tell when people have made up their minds about people they don't know. And it okay. And me a little bit, but hey. Okay. Okay. No, except sit here and just sit with these thoughts. And be like, hey, you realize you're actually hurting yourself with your own thoughts, you know? Like, you're not, like, why are you being angry about this? You're just making yourself angrier. And then to put it out in the world, you just make other people angry. And then it's like, but wait, what the fuck am I doing? Why am I going on Twitter? It just makes me angry. And that's like, what is the world even doing at this point? Nothing we do brings us happiness. We long for the gift of death, Diego. Do you think Sean Connery is good in this movie? <laughs> yeah, he's fine. <laughs> yeah. Actually, I, like, I think some people were like, he looks like he doesn't know what's going on. I actually think he does a fairly fine job with uh, the material. I do too. I will also say, uh, or I guess I'll ask, was Sean Connery a great actor? Or did people just like him because he's like 
you know, classically handsome and like suave and stuff like that. Um, Matt Connery was a good actor. Okay. Okay. Matt Connery, he did some good work. I, I agree. I was I was just asking asking a leading question. I don't know if he was a great actor. It's just he was a, he was a fine actor. Yeah. Um, when he wasn't beating his wife. When he wasn't saying you gotta slap a woman around every now and then. He just casually throws out in an interview. This is the guy, his big thing was like, I left James Bond because I thought the character was sexist. <laughs> it's like, what? <laughs> He's great in the uh, Murder on the Orient Express movie from the 70s. Oh yeah, the one that's almost as good as the Kenneth Branagh one? I'm just trying to piss you off now, I'm sorry. No, yeah. I had to let that sit there. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. Um, but... How about Charlotte Rampling? Oh, she's great. Yeah, she she's fucking... She's kind of the shit. Yeah. You want to know the very first thing I saw her in? What? She's in the last season of Dexter. I know. And that was before I was taking my deep dive. All of Dexter? <laughs> I did. What the fucking fuck is wrong with you? Oh, so many things. But yeah, that, that was the first thing I saw her in. Then, you know, as time goes on, I go back and I, I, I'm watching other stuff and I'm like, oh, she's, she's fucking, she's a legend. Did, That's did, that was inexcusable. Did Dexter come back. It did. It came back for uh, a redo of their finale. They didn't change anything, but they were like, "Yeah, we we, we dropped the ball there. Let's let's try to wrap it up properly. So it, new setting, new everything." So it's like Mass Effect Three. Anyway. Hey, 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 hey. Um, I didn't see the the redo season. I'll just call it the redo. Why would? Ah. Uh, I'm good. I'm good. Uh, Although I gotta, I have to say this, I have to complain about this. Um, not a film versus digital guy, as I've made clear many, many times. Whatever they did shooting the new season of Dexter, it, it looks like like shit. The skin tones look like like wood, like 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 the same color as the background of the forest trees sometimes. Why are we doing this? Who is doing this trend? Why are none of you grading and lighting your footage properly? Why why do people why do everyone look dead? <laughs> there you go. Why do everyone look dead? Everyone look dead. <laughs> yeah. See, we're we're turning into our own generation of the apathetics. I think so. This what's happening now. Why why do everyone do that? This is see, to me. This movie says a lot about our current society. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to become the Zardoz. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you want to talk about the sexual politics of this movie? Oh, I'm not touching that. Um, you do you. <laughs> all right, did you, all right. So, like, that thing they say about fucking like, there's a all right. There's a lot of talk of erections in this movie. Because all the Eternals are, uh, they're impotent, right? Uh-huh. I have, I have a point to, to go after this, actually. They can't have children. And all, like, the men are, like, really effeminate types, you know? Mm-hmm. They're, they're kind of, like, effeminate people. There's a scene in this which I cannot tell if it's a joke. Because that's the thing. There's all these effeminate men and that are the Eternals, but then, like, Sean Connery is one of the brutals, and he's, like, you know, he's Sean Connery. He's James Bond, which is, like... And a masculine ideal of some kind, you know? Or mm-hmm. definitely playing with that there. There's a scene in it where, like, he's he's trapped in some plastic. You remember this? Yes. And they're, like, beating on him. And, like, it's just a weird sequence. And then he starts stretching through it. And someone's like, no, he couldn't possibly. It's indestructible. And then he rips through it. But it's, like, literally just a plastic bag. So it, mm-hmm. like, a, press, a plastic bag... <laughs> and I cannot tell if maybe the joke there is that the men in this society are so weak and effeminate they can't rip a plastic bag. It almost feels like a joke, or just that John Borman doesn't know how to do the to achieve the imagery he wants. You know, I'm gonna I'm gonna guess it's a joke, but also he doesn't super know how to achieve the imagery he wants. I think that's it. Like a lot of his like actual like visual prowess as a director isn't like 
It's not great. It's not bad. But he can't quite get, like, the true mythical elements that he's he's searching for. He can't quite get there. You, there are you know? effects that look really good in this movie, and there are others that look just fucking terrible. And it looked like they were filmed for about $5, you know? Yeah, yeah. It's just like there was just no way to do the, his vision ever, but especially in the 70s. Yeah. There's. I wonder, it, what, did he study animation at any point? He might. I feel like, yeah, I, I feel like he's got like a real mind for the visual stuff. Just doesn't have the, the physicality to like provide it to the world. But, uh... I was thinking of there's a I, you know the I actually think the floating head of Zardoz looks pretty good. That's like one of the mm-hmm. effects in the movie. But then there's the scene where the head falls down at the end, and like they you see it falling, and then they cut away and they literally just shake the camera to indicate that it has crashed and there's been an explosion. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's like a car, it was like a Ninja Turtles effect, like. <laughs> Um, so yeah, so there's a lot of talk about penises and erections, and there's a feminine men, and then masculine Sean Connery. And like, the women of the Eternals are both intrigued, but also frightened of his like sexual prowess, you know? Mm-hmm. Part of it is just that they haven't, like, they haven't seen a man who can have an erection in a long time, but also it's like, the footage they're watching is of him like raping women, you know? Yeah. Then there's a lot of talk in this about like the the connection between fear and arousal and sexual stimulation in the brain, and it's uh, yeah, it raises a lot of questions. Yep. Yep. Uh, in the commentary, mm-hmm. uh, when Zed is finally able to resist Consuela's mind control. Uh, it was upsetting to the actress. Uh, and according to Borman, this is, these are his words, not mine, that Charlotte Rampling said she'd been looking forward to being... How do I put this? No, no, just say what, the, say what he said. It's his he was looking forward to being raped by Sean Connery and that it was all over much too quickly. Mm. That does sound like a Charlotte Rampling quote. <laughs> Yeah, it's just, it was, it was strange to, to bring that up is all, I guess. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, look, it's, it's, if it's a movie, it's not that. Like, like, all right, I'm trying to be delicate here, but it's like everyone, they're actors. They know they're acting, right? So like I'm mm-hmm. playing with that notion. And there are people that like scenarios like that where it's all, but it's all consenting, you know? Yeah, yeah. So, like, whatever. But, yeah, it's strange that Borman would think to bring it up again. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's Borman yeah. refers to this dystopian society as a matriarchal society, too, by the way. Mm-hmm. Oh, that's why she's in Dune. Yeah. I mean, so... I bet Denny likes this movie. He might. Yeah. I think Denny would make more interesting movies. <laughs> no offense, yeah. he's a fine director, but, like, this is some wild shit. <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, he's Canadian. That explains everything. Here's some other fun commentary from John Borman. Is it going to uh, reg- the sex stuff? Because <laughs> I uh no, <laughs> none of that explains it. Uh-huh. But uh oh, you know maybe this is one. The quilts worn by many of the Eternals were actually picked up by Borman while making Deliverance in Appalachia. All, all right. Yeah, it's it's not a, it's not a good or a bad thing. I just I thought that was interesting. That guy was making deliverance, and he just went quilt shopping like on a lark. <laughs> well, he was Irish. What's going? They they no they're the they're the they're the quilt guys, yeah, right? But like you're making deliverance. My mind would be other places. I I you know what you got a point. I just remember deliverance. <laughs> um. <laughs> 
Oh, and the film, it was also shot in Ireland while the IRA was still <laughs> very active, right? Oh, no. The IRA refused to allow the production to import any live weapons into the country, and Borman almost had to consider having to shoot the film elsewhere, but one of the technicians approached him and said, hey, I'm a member of the IRA, and we could supply whatever weapons you need. That, uh... That makes sense. Yeah. Eventually, though, that didn't it didn't come to that, and then the IRA just allowed uh, Borman to import his own weaponry for the film. Uh, but for the for the in case you're more worried about the budgetary concerns of this, um, Borman said that there's at one point they were so short of money that many of the costumes the extras had in the background were just painted directly onto their bodies with paint, which, um, like, I I. To me, that sounds more expensive. <laughs> That's a lot of paint, dude. <laughs> you know, like. <laughs> How are we feeling about the visuals in this movie? Uh, a, a little hit and miss. Yeah, I think. Like again, like I, I think Borman's got ideas. The goofy pyramid might be the silliest one. Yeah, I mean, when you open up your movie with the floating head. Yeah. That's a pretty. Uh, I, I, you're either on board or you're off board immediately, you know? And I don't know. It's, it's, it's such a mess of a movie, but it's so interesting. And there's, I don't, I don't know if I want to bring it up now because we already talked about some of the other stuff in this franchise. But, like, there's another movie I saw recently that I didn't love and I thought I was going to hate it and I couldn't bring myself to hate it. But it was, left me more confused than anything. Um, it's a movie that didn't work, but a lot of its ideas that I found in it, whether they were intentional or otherwise, I found very compelling, and I wanted to, like, take a look at some of the own, my own stuff I was writing, and I was like, oh, that's an interesting idea to pull from. Uh, Thor Love and Thunder is... Fuck. Well, because we already, we already did the divert to talk about Marvel stuff. Diseased fucker. I, I double featured Zardoz and Thor Love and Thunder. Fuck. I gave in. You. Because I like Thor a lot. And it's a bad movie. Why? Why do I like Thor? Yeah. Because I think he's an interesting character. Is he? And I and I think Chris Hemsworth is, like, my favorite of the Marvel guys. I think he's he's the, he's the second best Chris. Hemsworth is but... a good actor. Yeah. But what's, what's interesting about Thor? I think Hemsworth brings a lot of, like real human qualities to the character with like Hemsworth brings it. What's interesting about Thor? <laughs> I like that he's a dude who has to be more human as as he goes on. Like he can do all the fighting, he can do all the punching, he can do all the lightning shit. Like it's his own insecurities that are kind of like his biggest problem and I really like that, you know? But I'm not That's why the Disney's Hercules movie is so good. I do like the Disney's Hercules movie. You do. Of course. Yeah. Of course. It's a good movie. Of course. It's a little rough around the edges, but it's a good movie. A little. A little. Anyways, um, Thor Love and Thunder made me think of a lot of stuff kind of like Zardoz, where it's like, what good are these structures and symbols and these, these guy who just, symbols of guy, power? Guy who just watched <laughs> Thor <laughs> Getting a lot of Thor Love and Thunder vibes from this movie. <laughs> It's kind of the reverse. It was, it was the reverse, to be fair. Jesus Christ. <laughs> it's like, uh, look, it's bad. I'm never watching it again. I just wanted to say that it, I, I thought there was a lot of similarities in terms of like how they approach uh, their relationship to mythology. and uh, They approach their relationship to good storytelling? Uh, no, Zardoz is, is basically Citizen Kane compared to Thor Love and Thunder. Like... I need to make clear, it is a train wreck of a movie. Both in how they might have an underlying contempt of humanity. Also that, yeah, what the fuck was... Like, one moment we're like, hey, Jane has cancer? And then another moment we're like, oh man, Thor's making fun of his friend who he hasn't seen in like almost ten years and her arm is gone. Yeah, that might be the worst What in that movie. And there's a lot of bad scenes in that movie. Yeah. What... <laughs> 
what? And then it's just so annoying. And why do they have the goats doing the, the Taylor Swift thing? I know the history about why they, they thought it was funny when they were making the movie or whatever. I bet a lot of stuff's funny when you're fucking chalking up nose candy all the time. Hey, but like, not bad mouth John Borman. <laughs> but yeah, the goats thing was just why. Yeah. The moment that movie became about cancer, it's like anytime a joke happened, I'm like, Jane has cancer. <laughs> um, I, oh, fuck. I, I, again, I could do a whole thing on it, but I'm like, no, I have, I, I found some interesting, compelling material in individual sections of the film that definitely didn't help the rest of the movie, but really say I'll take them away. Your prejudice against Italians. What? Russell Crowe shows up in that movie. Isn't he supposed to be Greek? Because he's Zeus? He's like acting Italian. <laughs> Is I don't know. You you guys you guys have a history over there. I don't I don't wanna I I don't wanna make comparisons. Italians kinda sound Greek or Greeks kinda sound like Italians, I don't know. All goes back to that fucker Romulus. <laughs> Also, you know what? Did you see that? I, you probably didn't because no one gives a shit about this movie anymore. But there's a deleted scene with Thor and Zeus. I don't know where it would have gone in the movie. But Zeus is talking to Thor about how, like, oh, we need um, his lightning bolt, right? Because mm-hmm. they're going to they're gonna use it to, to catch the bad guy and, like, save those kids. And that's how, you know, Thor gets, gets like, an upgrade every time a new movie comes out. That's totally fine, whatever. But Russell Crowe is playing the character like a character and not a caricature. And he's explaining to Thor that, like, look, there's power all around us. It doesn't matter if it's it's in this lightning bolt. It could be in this branch. It could be in the individual, in the sky, wherever. Like, he's talking to, like, a really, like, ethereal presence into the movie. And I'm like, where the fuck did this come from? What you're telling me is... Not only did you find time to watch Thor Love and Thunder, <laughs> time to watch the deleted scenes. A, a single one. I saw it on, on my, my Twitter timeline. All right. Someone had retweeted it into my timeline. And I was like, ah, I want to see what this... I saw it before I saw the movie, too. So I was like, oh, I wonder where this would have fit in. It was like there was a lot of stuff cut from Thor Love and Thunder. Yeah, apparently it was like four hours long at one point. Including Peter Dinklage apparently was in it. Peter Dinklage comes back from Infinity War. Um, coincidentally, he made some comments about how he was upset with uh, the new uh, Snow White movie being made. Um, and then his... Hmm. Suddenly, they didn't really need to have seen anymore. Hmm. I'm just, just, just going to throw that one out there. <laughs> interesting. Very interesting. Peter Dinklage is great. I used to watch Cyrano. Uh, yeah, it's fun. All right, is is Zardoz better than Cyrano? I don't fucking know. Zardoz okay. on scale. Like, what can you compare Zardoz to? Uh, Thor Love and Thunder, apparently. Well, you can. I can, because I have brain worms. You're going to go to hell when you die. Oh, I definitely am. But, uh, unlike me, who's never done anything wrong, when it comes to movie opinions. Um, but... Yeah, this we can't even really touch upon most of the stuff that happens in this movie. Um, no, but we can touch upon. I like I like this movie. I think everyone should at least watch Zardoz once. Like the last like thirty minutes are a fucking slog. Like by then I kind of run out of goodwill for the movie. Mm-hmm. There was a moment where I was watching it, and my father insisted on watching it with me. Um because he remembered seeing it years ago. And there was a moment where I was like, I was kind of like, okay, let's wrap things up a little bit here. <laughs> and, and, like, and then it kept going. Well, it kept going, and then I paused the movie, and I was like, Jesus Christ, there's fucking 15 minutes left. <laughs> and it was like a lot of him running around in like the mirrors and stuff like that. Yeah. And he kills his... See, Borman... The barbaric version of himself. Yeah, Borman really likes like the, the reflective imagery yeah. in his stuff, I noticed. Like, he's... Imagery. <laughs> yeah. Hey, there you go. He likes imagery. About when the that... eye appeared on his hand in that one shot. Remember that one? Oh. Uh-huh. Hey, well, here. I'm going to end on a fun, positive commentary moment. 
when they turned into a uh, spirit Halloween store skeletons at the end? <laughs> no, um, but uh, Borman apparently had asked Connery if he'd ever considered using a different accent when he was acting, and then Connery replied, "If I didn't talk the way I talk, I wouldn't know who the hell I am." Right, mm -hmm. and then. Borman didn't, like, press that, apparently, when they were making the movie. But he goes on to acknowledge that Connery did win an Academy Award for playing an Irish cop with a Scottish accent in The Untouchables. <laughs> so it's like, who was, who was in the right there, you know? <laughs> like, I mean, that is the thing. with That is Hunt for Red October, though, where it's just like... It's like... He's, yeah. He's supposed to be a Russian, and America just doesn't give a shit. Like... Yeah. <laughs> the They're foreigners. Get them! Yeah. Yeah. Play our game. American Navy, right? <laughs> oh man, yeah, that's pretty funny. Um, yeah, I'm only patriotic when something bad happens to the British. So we we got like a week out of this Queen Diane. Yeah, oh, uh, that was yeah, that's pretty good. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, our steadiness is better than your steadiness. Although it's always weird when like a president dies here, and like we like we don't do like we don't go as insane as England does, but then like we have to stop and be like, oh no. Not Gerald Ford. <laughs> it's like, oh, the guy who got in because everyone else either got caught or resigned. Like, <laughs> and it's like, well, what was his major accomplishments? Um, he pardoned Nixon. It's like, what else? It's like, not much. <laughs> <laughs> like, oh, okay. <laughs> it's like, remember when H.W. Uh, Bush died, right? Mm -hmm. People had to be like, oh... Like, hey, H. Herbert Walker Bush. And it's like, 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 look, all presidents are bastards, but it's like, he would, what did he do? Like, <laughs> one of the least charismatic presidents we ever had. Like, read my lips, no new taxes. And then, of course, there were new taxes, because how else does the government work? Like... <laughs> Like, remember we had to stop and, like, be like, oh, H.W. Like, <laughs> <laughs> you know, like, at least Bush killed this country. Like, at least here <laughs> killed it. <laughs> In a way, that's worth commending. Yeah, I don't know yet. The <laughs> jury is still out. <laughs> We're either going to end up really cool and chill or we're going to elect Napoleon Bonaparte. <laughs> <laughs> but hey, maybe he'll invade Russia during the winter. Then, It'll all be okay. Then he gets overthrown and then the monarchy just comes back. History sucks. Yeah, history, history's not great. But we can learn from it. Much like we can learn from Zardoz. What's that Bush quote about history? In, his, uh, in history, we'll all be dead. Is that real? I think he said that once. I have vague memories of him saying that. <laughs> Fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice. You can't get fooled again. <laughs> <laughs> I know he said that one. <laughs> yeah, that, that one's... I, I love quoting that one. That's fucking... That, like, I can't do the ironic Trump joke stuff. Yeah. I can do... I can do Bush. He's a little better at doing the Trump ones. I don't know. I, I, I hate him too much. It's like, oh, you're just telling me... I mean, not that I don't hate George H.W. Bush, but... but... It's like, you're just telling me this now, and... Wow. <laughs> <laughs> like, that video of Trump, like... Where he does that weird, like... He's standing, but also leaning. Like, you know that Stan Trump has? Yeah. Like, I'm starting to appreciate the comedy of Donald Trump a little bit. I'm not saying, like, that it should overshadow anything. I'm just saying that, like, it's a little more noticeable. Um. Uh, yes, by the way, you are correct. George Bush did say, when he was asked about what he thinks about his place in history, he goes, history? We don't know. We'll all be dead. <laughs> Just fucking the stupidest fucking person. Oh my god. Like, that should have been the wake-up call before Trump to at least generations ahead of us that, like, oh, this is a sham. Yeah. Uh, and to many people it was a wake-up call. But, uh, not enough, I guess. Anyway, Zardoz, I'd recommend it. Yeah, Zardoz. It's a lot like the Bush administration. <laughs> Which, you maybe, maybe, a lot of... The penis is evil.
you know, that's just, you, you said it was in England, but that's kind of America. America right now. But yeah. Always yeah. England's always. Yeah. Yeah. And I will say, it's kind of hysterical that this movie just ends with, like, everyone getting shot and being happy. <laughs> that's why it's America. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> kill me next. There's a hysterical moment where Arthur and Friend, who we don't even need, really need to talk about, Friend, um, there's a hysterical moment where, like, like, let's kill each other. Like, let's go out together. And then Friend just gets shot. <laughs> Well, that's how I want to go. There's a really embarrassing moment where they have that psychic battle at the dinner table. Mm -hmm. Can you imagine being on set that day? No. Maybe you're it's just own... like that. It's just... I, I would con reconsider acting. What what uh, does moving your arms have to do with being psychic? I don't know. Professor X kind of does it. Did you ever see the... Uh... Yeah, but that's a comic book for children. Um, <laughs> there you go. Did you ever see uh, the the South Park episode where people think Cartman's a psychic? No, I missed that. He just has visions of food, so they just keep keep arresting fast food franchise employees. <laughs> but uh, there's a scene where the real psychics show up to be like, "Hey, you didn't get approval from the psychic society," <laughs> and it's like oh, the joke is they're all frauds, right? Mm -hmm. They do a psychic battle in one scene, and it's all of them just, like, waving their hands in weird ways. And it reminded me a lot of the scene in Zardoz. All right. That's Zardoz. Zardoz. And a lot of other stuff. And the answer was love. Was it? <laughs> Matt, is this your favorite John Borman movie? Oh, uh, Probably. Uh, really? Oh, I, I don't know. Uh, I don't know enough. I mean, he's got like fucking point blank and fucking uh, Deliverance, you know, and Excalibur. Yeah, I don't. I don't love Deliverance. Mm. Uh, point Blank is, is fucking remarkable. I love Point Blank. Have you ever seen Hell in the Pacific? No, I haven't either. I've been trying to track it down. I haven't seen most of his movies. Okay. I really want to see Hell in the Pacific though, because it's Lee Marvin and Toshiro Mifune. He did a he did a short film called Two Nudes Bathing. Now, I'm gonna ask something. Did he get caught in a Brian De Palma situation and just say he was making a short film called Two Nudes Bathing? Or was he just filming Two Nudes Bathing? Is that what the Palma did? I, no, I'm, that's like a De Palma plot. Oh, I thought the I thought you were saying De Palma. No, no, no. I mean, we all we all know Brian De Palma is cinema's greatest pervert, but I don't I don't know if he's a real life pervert. But one scene in one of his movies where it's him behind the camera, like filming a like a model like undressing, and then it's his voice being like, "All right, now take off take off the lingerie," and I'm just like, "What? I don't know. We didn't agree on that." It's like, "No, it's fine. Just take it off." It's one of his earlier films. Oh. So. Is that Hi Mom? It might be. Okay, that's a, that's a good movie. Um, I don't know. I don't, didn't know that part. I don't know all of De Palma's stuff. Like I saw Greetings once. Okay. But Greetings was kind of unwatchable. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, but I know some people really like it. Yeah. Um, I have not seen Greetings. Yeah. I did, however, watch Sisters for the first time last year. Oh, hey. Uh, holy shit. <laughs> That's a wild movie. That, that is. Everyone go watch Sisters after you watch Zardoz. Watch Phantom of the Paradise. That's his good one. Oh, Phantom of the Paradise is fucking remarkable. He, he's he got bangers. He's got Phantom of the Paradise, Carrie, Mission Impossible, uh, Carlito's Way, Blowout is probably my favorite, uh, Body Double. Uh, Snake Eyes, I think, is super underrated. If you want to... I, I want them to restore the original ending to Snake Eyes. Did they film it, though? They did, but it's like... A, it was only a work print. Like, oh, yeah. Fucking refilm that, then. What the fuck? Or, or re, rework it. I, I'm going to yeah. with his original idea that, like, it would take a tidal wave to, like, wipe clean the city. Like... Yeah, yeah. That's a great fucking ending. It makes perfect sense, and I don't know why they cut it, so... Um, 
I would that would be, that might that this is gonna sound crazy. It might be my favorite of his movies if that ending was included. That's not crazy. I think it's a great movie. Snake Eyes is kind of wild. Yeah. But Paul was a weird guy. As I assume Borman is. Actually, uh, yeah. I actually don't know a ton about John Borman, so. What? Yeah, I just know that Mark Kermode wants to fight him. Yeah, Mark Kermode <laughs> has beefs. I know, it's so funny. Uh, he, he hates Michael Bay, John Borman. Um. But he loves he hates, Exorcist 3. He hates Tarantino post Jackie Brown. Does he? He's going, oh, I didn't know that. He was. He said that, like, at Jackie Brown, Tarantino was at his most brilliant, and then he devolved him to just doing genre films. And that's, like, his take ever since then. Hmm. I don't agree with... I know he didn't love Nope. And I was like, you fucking traitor. Hmm. But he did concede that he thought film critics and like film lovers would love nope and that the general public wouldn't Mm. and then it turns out well no most people did love it just not a lot of people saw it no uh what has to be my favorite red letter media half in the bag bit is mike stoklasa reading one star rotten tomatoes reviews with contempt oh yeah yeah that's pretty great that for the nope one because he was reading negative reviews that nope got Uh, yeah so are we going to do Nope for Halloween? Like, Nope and Us and I would, Get Out? I would love to do all the Jordan Peele stuff. Yeah, I think we have to. I think this is our announcement then for that. So that might be what we're doing. Yeah. And we got to do Halloween when it comes out. So those are... The- oh, yeah. Oh, my God. <laughs> okay. Oh, well, yes, we will do that. Halloween We will... Ends. Do that. Halloween ends. For now. You know, at least this series. You know what's weird? Halloween Kills has aged both worse and better for me. Is it weird that I kind of get what you mean? Yeah, you get it, right? Yeah. Something about that fucking weird movie. And it, it's just so ugly. Yeah, it's so <laughs> ugly, and it's also like so silly that I don't know if that's what Dave and Gordon Green was really going for, but I'm glad it got that silly Mm -hmm. so how about that exorcist film he's supposed to be doing he's supposed to be doing three yeah but we'll see if he gets one god really this all this fucking shit just is a flat circle because it's like exorcist 2 we're talking about halloween oh that's also leading back to the exorcist like or maybe the exorcist is just (laughs) eternal i think he said though he wasn't gonna change the continuity for the new exorcist Awesome. Which is what you want to hear. Although, I don't know what you do with, like, Domin- Dominion or whatever the fuck. Um, yeah. Oh, the the Schrader one? Yeah. Like, I don't know what you do with the prequels. Uh, I don't know. Just leave them as is. Just, just don't bring it up anymore. Like, it's fine. Actresses ends up having one of the most diverse uh, series of films. Yeah. I wish all of them were as good as the first and third one. Mm-hmm. And then I, I'd I be happier about it. I need that. I just, I like that they're all different, you know? Yeah, like the failures of Exorcist 2 and Exorcist 4, both versions of it, mm. uh, are completely separate from the fact that, like, you, you know, they're, they're just not good movies. They're not, it's not that they're bad Exorcist movies. The, the Rennie Harlan 4 is kind of the one that, like, I just kind of don't vibe with at all. Like, but, Yeah, yeah. Well, he fucking reshot an entire movie. Yeah. <laughs> and it's like... And then both versions of it end up being like kind of a rush hack job. Do you remember? It's like, uh, do you remember when Exorcist Four was coming out? They did one of those like cursed film documentaries, and they were like the curse of the Exorcist, and they tried to like trace all this horrible shit back to the Exorcist films. I do kind of remember that. And Ray Harlan participated in it, <laughs> and it was this. I re- I remember this uh, very vividly. So like. They're like, Exorcist, the beginning, might be the most cursed of them all. And it was like, well, John Frankenheimer was supposed to direct it, and then he died unexpectedly, right? Oh. First one, so it's like, the curse strikes. And then Rennie Harlan, like, during, I think, post-production, Rennie Harlan got, like, hit by a car or something like that. Jesus. I don't know what that means, you know? Like, 
No, yeah, I know. Just being hit by a car. I didn't know he was hit by a car. I was with someone who got hit by a truck right in front of me. And then they just got up and we just went to like an ER and they were fine. Like, <laughs> sometimes that happens. They got hit. I'm not saying like it was like a, like a tap. They got hit. And it was, like, oh, I just saw someone die. And then it's like, oh, no, they're fine, actually. So I don't know what happens. But, <laughs> so but he was like, and then it was like, they, so they do that. So like John Frankenheimer dies, Randy Arnold gets hit by a car. And then it's like, and Paul Schrader's film had to get reshot. <laughs> And they tried to be like, oh, that's part of the curse, too, I guess. <laughs> um, hey. Yeah, film uh, under Harlan's direction in winter 2003. Two weeks into production, the direction, director shattered his leg after being struck by a car, resulting in a two-week hiatus. Zardoz. They gave third. They gave him thirty five million dollars just to reshoot the movie. Holy fuck! Okay, that I, I'd reshoot a movie for that. No, no, I mean they gave. That was the budget. I don't mean they paid. Oh, okay. I thought that. I was like, damn, they're fucking desperate for a franchise. <laughs> like, I'm just saying that's that's how Hollywood used to spend its money. So now they just well, I'm gonna it's Morbius twice. No, yeah, but at least it bombed even harder the second time, which is pretty great. Morbin. No. Morbin. You better not fucking watch that movie. I, have, I honestly, I don't even know where I'd have to go to watch it. I have no interest. Uh, Netflix now. I mean. Anyways, Matt, thanks for joining me on this Zardoz episode. And on our final episode, we'll be talking about Day of the Dolphin. And, uh, and I'll have to mail you that Blu-ray. So, <laughs> if the episode's delayed, it's because of that. Yeah, you have to. Yes. The Blu-ray and other things. So. Yes. Um, yes. Yes. Everything's going great. Everything's going to be fine. Everything's going to be perfectly fine. Yeah. Okay, Matt. Where, where can the people find you? I'm at OTN at Twitter.com. Just the OTN? No, no one? No. One, whatever. Okay, we'll leave a link in, in, in the description the, down below. Uh, you can find me at the Diego Crespo on Twitter. Check out the Waffle Press on Twitter, YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, iTunes, and Patreon. Get early access to Day of the Dolphin, maybe? 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 Uh, also, uh, at least one segment where Matt and I were talking before the episode, and we just ended up talking about, like, an hour worth of bullshit. Uh... But that, that's usually just what we do in general. So thank you everyone for listening. Thanks for watching. Like and subscribe. If you didn't like this, like and subscribe anyways because you might find something you do like. All right, take care. Thanks for listening again. Uh, we have been professionally, <laughs> you've been professionally unprofessional. Hi, Jonathan Demi. Goodbye. Zardoz has spoken. Zardoz.